Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. John and Julie Gottman have studied relationships for 40 years, and they've concluded that key to a relationship's success is not whether the couple has conflicts, because all couples do, but how they're addressed. In a recent post, on a recent talk with you, I offer a sample dialogue, but the example I gave was a relatively easy one. One partner wants to visit the relatives more often. Well, here are three thornier conflicts, uh, one about sex, one about money, and one about parenting. Most of my clients learn best by example, so here are some sample dialogues and uh, a sample dialogue for each of those and the embedded principles. The first one's about sexual pace. Partner one says, I always feel you're rushing to the, quote, main event. Partner two says, I'm attracted to you. I can't help it. Partner one says, if it's truly beyond your control, okay, but might there be anything you could do? It would make me feel more loved, not to mention hot. Now note that partner one didn't argue. Partner one said, if it's beyond your control, okay. But partner one also asked a question rather than issue an order and implied that partner two might also benefit from uh, slowing down. Partner two then says, do I really have to think about baseball scores while we're having sex? Partner one says, I'm wondering if either of the following might be a better, I'm wondering if the following might be a better uh, alternative. You're goal-oriented in everything, work, sports, and yes, sex. Is it realistic to ask you to make our goal to make the pleasure last longer? Partner one offered a suggestion that was aligned with partner two's personality, being goal-oriented. Partner two says, I doubt it, but maybe I could try. So maybe I could try focusing on you for a few minutes so that I won't be quite as eager for the <coughs> main event. Partner one said, I'd love that. There's a time to be deaf. Partner one wisely chose to ignore, I doubt it, but supported partner two's suggestion. Partner two then said, I'm not committing to staying with that, only trying it as an experiment. Partner one said, that's all I could ask. Partner one was reasonable in not asking for more than a minimal commitment, for starters. If that works at all well, partner one might not even have to ask partner two to continue the experiment. Partner two might do so without another word being said about it. Okay, the second dialogue. This one's around spending. Partner one says, I look at our credit card bills and I cringe. You're spending on yet another pair of shoes, another, another purse and expensive ones, and we're saving Zippo. I thought you cared about security. Partner one tried to appeal to a core value of partner two to no avail. Partner says, I work too, I deserve it. Partner one says, of course you deserve a good life, but might there be a less risky way to get it? that will last longer than shopper's high. No sooner than you've bought one unnecessary thing than you buy another one. It was good that partner one framed it as a question, you know, uh, might there be another way that'll last longer than shopper's high, but the statement that followed that, you know, uh, no sooner have you bought one unnecessary thing, you'll buy another, that's very likely to make the partner two defensive, and it did. Partner two says, what do you want me to do, meditate? Partner one says, well, what might you want to do? Loud extended silence. Partner one doesn't break the silence, giving partner two time to think and to get to lower their defensiveness. Partner two says, I like shopping. Maybe I could buy less expensive things and get almost the same benefit. Partner one says, what do you think? Now, J.W. Marriott called those four words, what do you think, the most powerful in the English language. Also, partner one didn't enthuse. That would have reduced partner two's sense of ownership in the idea. Partner two says, I guess I could try it. Nothing to lose by trying. Partner one just nodded so that partner two would retain the agency. Partner one waited. Again, partner one was wise in choosing not to jump in in hopes that partner two might, being on a roll, say something else constructive. Partner one then says, and just maybe, rather than giving Amazon all my money, I could start investing in Amazon a share at a time. Partner two says it's expensive, 3,500 bucks a share. But many brokerages from Schwab to Fidelity let you buy fractional shares, even just $5 worth and commission free. Partner one said that might be fun to try, but again, this is just an experiment. Partner two says fair enough. The third and final of these sample dialogues is regarding parenting strictness. Partner one says, why are you crying? 
partner too, says, it hurt me to see you send Johnny to have his dinner in his room just because he said he needed five more minutes to finish his video game. Saying it hurt me to say you send Johnny was more compelling and less engendering of defensiveness than, for example, I can't believe you sent Johnny to his bedroom or whatever. Partner one says, he always needs five minutes. He's got to learn. Partner two says, do you think that he and maybe you'll pay a price for being so strict? Making the point as a question rather than a statement is less accusatory and allows the person, in this case, person, uh, a person one more agency. Partner one says, no, no, lack of respect for parents is one of those things that's ruining this country. He needs to learn that he's not the center of the universe. Partner two says, I agree. Do you think that you and I need to create a united front up on what we will and won't be strict about? Now, partner two there started her response with, a, or his, whatever, response with a legitimate point of agreement, and then comes up with a reasonable idea, but again presents it as a question. Partner one says, of course, but you want to be quite laissez-faire, and I want to set reasonable boundaries. Partner two says, might it help if you and I made a list of what we think would be behaviors that are just on either side of the boundary? I mean, it's a no-brainer that if he stole from us, we wouldn't let that go. What do you think? Partner two didn't take the bait, but instead deflected by making a statesman-like proposal. That, you know, that proposal that, you know, let's agree on what might be on the boundaries. That would allow both partners to have an equal say in the matter. And partner one says, I guess. And that's about as much as partner two could reasonably expect. Partner two then says, what if we uh, agree that when we ask Johnny to do something, we'll give him no more than two minutes leeway? Now, partner two there wisely began the negotiation with a sign of good faith, starting by capitulating a bit to partner one's viewpoint. That made it more likely that partner two also would be gracious. Partner one then said, well, I guess I mean partner one would be more gracious. Partner one then said, maybe even better if we tell Johnny a few minutes in advance. For example, dinner's going to be in two minutes, fair warning. Partner two says, sounds great. Want to suggest another behavior that's on the boundary? Partner one says, okay. Now, of course, not all conflicts are going to be addressed so readily, but the models, the, you know, the sample dialogues, and the embedded principles might be a good place to start. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco. I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.